Welcome to the 247th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with crime, mystery, and thriller writer Steve Hamilton, author of many books, including The Second Life of Nick Mason and Dead Man Running. Just one programming note, this interview was recorded earlier at the publication date of The Second Life of Nick Mason. Stay tuned for the interview with Steve Hamilton. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Steve Hamilton, New York Times bestselling mystery writer. Hamilton's new novel is The Second Life of Nick Mason. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about The Second Life of Nick Mason yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, it's a it's the first book in a new series. And to put yourself in the shoes of the main character, you just have to imagine that you are in prison and that you've been sentenced to 25 years to life uh, with no chance of getting out early. Um, and you are offered this deal that will get you out. And it doesn't just get you out. It gets you into this whole new life. You're, you're living in this fancy townhouse. You're driving this amazing car. You have this r- nice roommate, a uh, very attractive roommate, and you have money beginning of every month. I mean, it's everything that a person could want. Uh, there's only one catch to this deal. And the deal is that, the catch is that anytime the phone rings, you have to answer it. And you have to do exactly what you are told to do. No matter what it might be, no matter what kind of crime it might be, no matter what horrible thing you might have to do, uh, that's the deal that you made, and there is no getting out of it. Great. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus for the second life of Nick Mason? Yeah, I mean, I, I had done... I had done 10 books in my Alex McKnight series, and Alex is an ex-cop who's living in a very remote place up in northern Michigan, and it just felt like it was time to do something different again. I had had the same kind of feeling that I had with the, with, with, with the Lock Artist, which is a book I wrote, wrote a few years ago about a young safecracker, and it was a great experience because you, you get to go out and do something totally different write about a new kind of character, learn a lot of, a lot of new things. I learned all about safe cracking and, and lock picking. And then I came back to the McKnight series and I just, I sort of had this new kind of energy for it. So it just felt like it was that time again, you know? So I, I was playing around with another kind of character entirely, you know, it was, a, it was a, sort of a starting with this career criminal um, and seeing if I could still sort of build that bond with the reader uh, even, you know, given, given his past. And I was working with Shane Salerno by then, who is a Hollywood producer, a Hollywood screenwriter. He's, you know, he's, he's writing one of the sequels to Avatar, you know, just the, the most successful movie of all time. And he's uh, adapting The Cartel, which is Don Winslow's just, just amazing book from last year. And we were just talking a lot and throwing some ideas back and forth. And we we sort of had a couple ideas collide and Nick Mason is sort of what came out of that. Just, just the situation that he's in, um, you know, being on call 24 seven, having to do whatever he's told, you know, having to commit these just more and more dangerous crimes and, um, you know, having everywhere he goes, he's being watched and everyone he touches in his life, uh, you know, he, he puts them in danger. Uh, and at the same time, the only, you know, the thing that's driving him is that the reason that why he wanted to get out of prison in the, in, the, in the first place is that he wanted just to see his family again. He wanted to see his ex-wife. And more than anything in the world, he wanted to see his daughter again, who he hasn't seen in, in five years, which is most of her life. So um, he has this really human sort of drive to him, this totally basic human reason why he took this deal in the first place. Which I which I hope the reader can connect with and and understand and empathize with, but he's in this impossible situation. There's just this you know this extraordinary tension that he lives under in this this tight you know vice grip because that's the deal he made. 
Sure. Well, you just mentioned your best-selling Alex McKnight series, and 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 we're talking about the second life of Nick Mason. What appeals to you as a writer and a reader about mystery and suspense novels? Crime fiction has always been my favorite. Um, you know, I mean, it's just there's something about crime fiction and 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 the, and the mortal stakes that are at work there, and the and the total the the total idea of 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 the story having to just go you know i mean mm-hmm. you read a crime novel and it just has to go or it or it doesn't work you know and it's and it's just the best it's just an amazing field of fiction that has been elevated by some amazing writers i i already mentioned don winslow and the cartel last year i mean that's just an example of of what crime fiction can do this is this is such a huge issue this uh, the, the the drug wars that are going down in Mexico, and it's typical, you know, that that it takes a crime writer to really get to the heart of it and to really show you what it what it's like down there right now. And you know, there are so many other great writers in this field and have been ever going, you know, going back to Raymond Chandler and guys like Lee Child and Michael Conley uh, and Harlan Coben. It's I mean, I could go on and on. There's there's so many great writers in this field. It just seems like it's the one field of fiction where you can do anything right now. Sure. So, so what, what was your original path to, to writing fiction? What, what made you sit down and, and write your first Alex McKnight novel? Well, yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I've, I think I've, I've always been a writer, you know, always, it just feels like that's what I always wanted to do. Uh, but, but real life, kind of has this way of happening to you. And I, and that's how I ended up working at, at IBM when I got out of college. Um, and I worked there for a little over 30 years full time. And it was pretty exhausting because, you know, it, it really felt like I was living this double life. Uh, you know, I would work eight, nine hours every day, not counting the commute. And I, I'd come home and, you know, my family would finally go to bed and I'd stay up really late writing and, you know, maybe get up the next day, write some more before I went to work again. Um, it was, like I said, it was pretty exhausting. And when the, some of my coworkers, they'd be going on vacation and I'd be getting ready to go out on, on, on my next book tour. Um, but I was fortunate, you know, I was very fortunate because I was able to make that work. I was able to write 12 books that way. And, uh, you know, I put two of them on the extended bestseller list. I won a couple of, of Edgar Awards. Wrote a couple of New York Times notable books of the year. I mean, it, it was that's what that's all I needed to keep me going, you know, because it meant that it was worth all this extra work I was doing because I was keeping that that promise to myself and, and doing the one thing that I that I knew that I had a passion for. So, what advice would you have for aspiring <clears throat> writers who might be listening and are interested in writing their own novels and short stories? Well, yeah, I mean, people ask me that all the time, and it's and it's 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 a it's a funny question because it's it's almost like if you want to do it badly enough, you're going to do it, and if you don't, you're not, and that's okay if 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 you don't, because it's a lot of work, and there's there's no guarantees. People people write because they have to. People write because there's, you know, as John Irving said, there's any anything else would not be satisfying. Uh, so. You just have to make that decision that you're going to write and, and you're going to, you know, whatever happens, you're going to keep doing it. And, I mean, it took me 30 years until I was finally a full-time writer. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it takes, you have to do it every day. You have to, I mean, this, these are all the old saws that any writer will tell you. You, ju- you just have to do it. Sure. So are there ever days when you sit down at your computer and the words aren't flowing? And, and what do you do on those days? If that's the case, uh, uh, yeah. Sometimes that that happens to any writer, um, even even someone like Stephen King, you know, who who has a great book um, on on writing. By the way, if you, if you are an aspiring writer, I would just pick up that book. I mean, it's just it's such a great no nonsense approach to how he goes about it. And obviously, he's been very prolific and he's had a lot of success. And so it's somebody that that you should listen to. You know, whether you love Stephen King's books or not, I I happen to to love his writing, but, um, just listen to somebody who's done it 
and, and that's, that's a great book to pick up. And also uh, look up Elmore Leonard's 10 Rules of Writing, too. Another master who uh, I had you know, huge respect for and was a big influence on me. And he, he sort of summed up all the rules of writing in, in, in 10 easy rules that are pretty easy to remember. And it's, it's just great, no-nonsense advice again. Um, but as far as, you know, as far as the days when it's not coming, those are the days when you really prove to yourself that, that you're a writer because, you, because you, you, you do what you can anyway. And maybe, maybe it won't be your best day, but maybe something, there's something that will come out of that day, even if you don't end up using any of it, that will make you think of something else the, the day after that. Um, sure. You know, you, you, you can't just use it as an excuse. So I know you mentioned earlier, but are there books and authors that inspire your own writing at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I grew up just reading these, just loving American hard-boiled fiction. I mentioned Raymond Chandler already; he was one one of the best. Um, there was there was one writer, James Crumley, who I absolutely loved. He wrote a book called The Last Good Kiss, and another one called Dancing Bear. I mean, these are the kind of books that made me want to be a crime writer myself someday. Um, and, uh, just, you know, Elmore Leonard, again, I, I mentioned him. These are the guys that I, that I love reading and that, and that's where it all starts. So, so what are you working on now? I'm actually just about to hand in the, uh, next book in the Alex McKnight series. That'll be number 11. Um, I think, you know, again, when you, when you, when you take a break from a series and you, and you go back to it with, with this new perspective, I think it can really help you a lot as a writer. And I think this will be the, the, the best book next, uh, sorry, the best, best book yet. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And, uh, and besides that though, I'm, I'm, de- I'm, I'm pretty deep into the second, uh, Nick Mason book. Uh, because that's, you know, this is this, uh, this book, the second life of Nick Mason, which we just came out yesterday, by the way. Uh, is the first book in a series. And, and if you think about this, you know, where he's at, having to answer that phone, go out and do whatever he's told, I mean, that book can just take him anywhere. I mean, you know, it, it could go anywhere. And that's the thing that's the most exciting about this about this new series. And that's why, and having learned so much about developing a series from doing the Alex McKnight books for, for so long. I've, I've got so much of, of, of a better idea up front of where this series can go that I really sort of have the first seven books all kind of laid out. Um, so, so, so that's great because I, I, can, I can already see it's just going to go into all the, to some pretty amazing places and, and some of the other characters in the in this series are going to go through some pretty dr- dramatic transformations and some, you know, people you think of as allies now, now might turn into enemies or enemies into allies. There's going to be a lot of surprises, a lot of twists and turns. And I think, um, I would think, you know, if, if anybody likes the Alex McKnight books, I just, I hope and I think that they will really, really like Nick Mason. Great. Well, I know that with uh, the second life of Nick Mason, that you're now uh, with a new publisher, and I think it probably I think it probably surprised you at, at the amount of attention that uh, your your new publisher has gotten. But I wonder if for the people listening, if you couldn't just talk about that a little bit of you know how you were published in, in the Alex McKnight series and what the process was for for this new book. Yeah, and that's a whole story right there, believe me. But um, it's it was pretty overwhelming. But you know this this was the most important book of my career of of, of my life. That's that's what this felt like. And I, I just I I finally got to this point where I couldn't stand by and watch this book die. You know, it felt like it was just like maybe my last chance to really break out and get to a whole new place, uh, as, as an author, um, after 17 years with the same, same publisher, um, and the only publisher that I ever had, uh, this is St. Martin's press. Uh, I started with them. I saw so many other writers start with them and leave that place, you know, and I was, I was the one author who stayed loyal and I, I would sit at conferences and they would tell me, why are you still with them? And I would defend them, and I would say, "This is this is the publisher that I've been with, and I believe in them." And it's things are going to change, you know. Maybe I was naive, maybe I was too loyal, but mm-hmm. I'd already sold a million books for them, 
And when Shane started representing me, we signed this new book, this four book deal with them. And, and, and he signed that deal because I told him that's what I wanted to do. I want to stay here. And they made all these promises for this new series. Um, and they were, they were, uh, we got to a point last summer, we were 60 days away from the release date. I mean, we, the books are literally about to go out to the printer. They're, it's like the next day the presses are going to roll. And we're, we, we asked them to finally see this plan, this, this marketing plan that they had promised us. And, if, and you know, well, where's, where's the plan? And we got it. And it's like, where where is it? Where's the where's the media? Where's the where are the profiles? Where are the interviews? Where's the stuff that's gonna you know make a difference and break me out from where I am, just being the Michigan writer guy? Where's the stuff that's gonna help me sort of be something else? Um, and it just the the book just it just wasn't didn't it just wasn't there. This book was just gonna go out without any any kind of support. I mean, it was just so obvious and it was so kind of terrifying because I and I remember that night I was talking to Shane and we both we just sort of both got to the same place at the same time we're like you know we have to leave I mean it's you know it's it's an amazing thing to even say it you know, we, we have to leave we're 60 days away we, but we, we you know we can't let this happen and it was just the most terrifying experience the next couple of days going through that um, and I was lucky to have Shane on, on my side because he believed in this book as much as I did but you know we didn't know I mean we had started to get some good quotes from some authors but we didn't know about any of this other stuff that was going to come out in the starred reviews or Stephen King was, was going to tweet about it or anything we just you know we didn't know all that, that stuff was going to happen this year we just believed in, in the book you know in, in this character and Shane you know again Shane's probably the only person in the world I mean how many how many authors have an agent who would buy out the contract? Um, you know, so he's, he's not just my agent, you know, he's, he's like my brother, but as soon as we told them we were going to do this, they, same irons came right back and I said, you, you know, you are making the biggest mistake of your life. You are ending your career. So, uh, that was another really long <laughs> night. I really long. I remember we were, my wife and I, we were just, we were just lying in bed. We were, you know, we weren't sleeping. We we're staring at the ceiling. You know, I, I had left IBM by then. I, I left my full-time career at IBM to bet everything on this book. You know, it just this is this was it. This was our family's future. It was it, this was everything. And we're just like, you know, what if they're right? What if what if this is like the biggest mistake of our lives? You know, and then, um, but but we did it. We left because we had to. And when we left, we, we had this agreement with St. Martin's, you know, I mean, I'd been there for 17 years. We, I mean, we published 12 books together. Um, I had been, you know, the one person I was, I was a good soldier who was, who, who was loyal. And now that I felt like we had to leave, you know, it just sort of in, in deference to all that time and what we'd done together, the awards and everything, we just, we had this agreement, you know, okay, let's, let's do this the right way. Let's, do it quietly, respectfully. Let's not make a big thing about it. Let's n nobody says I anything in public. It's just we're going to leave and wish each other well on the way out the door. Um, but that morning that we left, after, after we did this, they they came out. They they uh, I'm sorry. There's there's no other way to say it. They just they they broke that agreement. They they issued this little terse statement that they were canceling the publication of this book you know like like it would like this was their idea right their their decision because of whatever unnamed the reason you know that they were going to they were not going to publish this book and so we it's like it it i can't even tell you how much that hurt just it's like we just we made this agreement that we were just going to do this the right way. And it's like, you're, you're trying to wreck my career on the way at the door. You're trying to make me, you know, damage goods and, and, and make, you know, make sure that no other publisher would ever touch me. And, and, you know, it really, really hurt after all those years. And, um, and, but you know, the way it turned out, it, it sort of kind of backfired on them because the one thing we had going was that, I mean, this, this manuscript was, was out there. It was, it was in galleys by then. So editors could uh, get their hands on it and read it. And um, 
you know, this, the, the, the whole story of, you know, because we had to respond to that press release and we had to clarify that it was our, our decision. It became this big news item on, you know, literally the front page of Publishers Weekly. It became, it became like their third or fourth most clicked on story of the year. You know, it was, it was insane, but, you know, at, at, at that point it sort of took on this life of its own and it, and it felt like it wasn't really about me so much anymore. If that makes any sense. It was like, it's like these other authors were just sort of, it sort of touched the nerve and all these other authors who had maybe gone through the same thing or, or going to, or could see themselves going through it. They had their own stories, you know, that they had gone through. Maybe they weren't as lucky to have somebody who could, uh, who could get them, get them out of situations like I did. So it just it just took on this life of its own, and um, I heard from so many other authors. It, and it's funny some of the some of the happiest authors that I heard from were were other St. Martin's authors who have to <laughs> r- remain anonymous, of course. But right, they, right. one of them told me, you know, I feel like I'm in a jail cell. I'm looking through my bars, the bars in my window, and I'm watching you run through a hole that you just cut in the fence, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it just, I mean, it was just, it was so humbling and so overwhelming. And I, you know, I'd never take it for granted that everybody was so supportive. My, all my fellow authors were, you know, and within 24 hours uh, of us leaving, uh, Shane started getting offers from other publishers. And by the end of that day, he had, offers from 10 other publishers and you know sometimes it was different imprints like in, in the same houses were sort of fighting over it a little bit so it was, again it was just like so amazing and then by the end of that night he's on this late night phone call with with ivan held who's the president of putnam and he calls me up and says we have a new deal with putnam so from you know from from the scariest most terrifying experience just a couple nights before to finding myself in this, in this new place with the right people who are going to really support the book. I mean, I can't tell you how much, how, how good that felt, how, how much that meant to me, how much, um, how excited I am about, you know, being here now. Uh, I'm just, you know, the book just came out yesterday. The book that was supposed to come out last year, it just finally came out this year. It just came out yesterday, and all these amazing things that have happened this week. I got my first review in the in, in the New York Times by Janet Maslin. I'm, I'm getting you know national re- reviews for the first time. I got you know the Chicago Tribune came out yesterday, Wall Street Journal came out this week, uh, Associated Press will will come out uh, soon. It's just it's just been the most amazing, incredible crazy but great in a in a great way week of my life and i'm just starting the, the book tour now i'm 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 in michigan right now because that's sort of it sort of felt like it was good to sort of go back and start where this all kind of began for me sure but i'm gonna go i'm gonna be in chicago i'm gonna be in denver and houston and arizona and seattle and portland and california St. Louis and then Boston and New York, of course, and it's 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 just going to be an incredible month. And but I'm I'm really looking forward to it. That's great. Well, where can people find you online to learn more about you and your books? Sure, um, my website is authorstevehamilton.com. Just put the author in front of my name. dot com, or you can certainly find me on Twitter at author Steve. Or I'll go to Facebook at Steve Hamilton Author. Um, I love hearing from people on all the formats. I, I try to respond all you know as much as I can. I, I love interacting with readers because that's what this is all about, and that's you know that's that's what a book tour is all about: going to stores and meeting people and and talking about the books. And um, you can do that online too. So and I, I I really like doing that. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Steve Hamilton, New York Times bestselling mystery writer. Hamilton's new novel, The Second Life of Nick Mason, as he just said, is just just out in bookstores now. So go grab a copy. And Steve, thanks for doing this interview. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Not since flying reindeer have the holidays seen something so amazing. 
just in time to make selfie-ready holiday hair easy. Introducing the do-it-all styling tools for glam holiday hair. The holidays are happier with glam hair. And the Not Doctor all-in-one dryer brushes from Conair makes it easy. Detangle, dry, and style in one step. No elf needed. The Not Doctor collection has a dryer brush for every hair type and style. The Pink Smoothing Paddle dryer brush has Flexalite bristles for painless detangling and high-performance power for quick styling and smooth, shiny results. And the purple dryer brush comes with a bonus volumizing attachment to boost lift and volume at the roots. It's perfect for salon blowouts at home. And since they're ideal for every hair type and length, they make great gifts for everyone on your list who wants beautiful hair without the hassles. Shop the Not Doctor dryer brushes at conair.com or at your favorite retailers now.